Um, I'll launch this and Jenny will come in a little bit time. Um, so there's the, we're talking about preparing for death with a focus on advanced decisions and setting that in the context of some of the key issues that have already been raised today, particularly the medicalization of dying, the fact that individuals are different, influenced by, amongst other things, religious and cultural variability, but also personal preferences, and the idea that death is both a fate that awaits all of us, but also at the same time, a decision that's made. As someone said earlier, we'll die when the doctors let us. So Jenny and I have done a lot of work around death and dying over the past decade, um, including two big festivals in Dying Awareness Week, um, in, one in York and one in Cardiff, uh, involving members of the public, and music, art, poetry, film, public debate, in order to try and raise consciousness of issues around death and dying. We are jointly co-directors of the Coma and Disorders of Consciousness Research Centre at Cardiff University. So we work with the families of people in vegetative and minimally conscious states, and we've also created an online resource for people, uh, the families of those people, and a whole load of training resources. We're currently developing one on life-sustaining treatments, and I'm also a member of the British Association, core group on clinically assisted nutrition and hydration, and co-founder of the charity Advanced Decisions Assistance. So the structure of the talk today is that I'm going to hand over to Jenny to talk about our family experience uh, with our sister Polly, who did not have an advanced decision, lasting power of attorney. Then talk about how those things work in practice under the law of England and Wales. And then show actually how in practice they did work effectively when our mother was dying, Sheila Kitsinger. So the experience we're talking about is about Polly. Polly was catastrophically brain injured in a car crash about 10 years ago. And all her family believed that she would have refused treatment if she could have given her prognosis, but medical treatments were delivered for years in what was first a vegetative state, then she moved into the minimally conscious state, and after a couple of years, she emerged into a fully conscious state, but with profound physical and neurological disabilities, with a quality of life she would not have considered worthwhile, based on her previous discussions with her. Now, the law in England and Wales meant that in the absence of advanced decision, she came under best interest decision making. And this, of course, is not just clinical, but should consider the person's own values, wishes, and beliefs. And I could talk to you forever about Polly and how she lived her life and what she enjoyed, whether it was mountain climbing or being a sailing instructor for a while or just making a superb garden. But I want to focus on one of the very core values that she fought for, both individually and politically throughout her life, which was the importance of voice, the importance of respect for what the individual wanted, and that was a right that should not be lost when someone lost their voice through some form of disability. She was also quite a critic of, at both a beautiful cartoonist and a critic of some doctor-patient relationships. So this was a cartoon she drew, you can hang from the chandelier if you want to, to satirise doctors who might respond to women's requests to be able to move about in childbirth with this sort of rather dismissive statement. And another cartoon she drew, which I think is beautiful because it actually talks about wise and unwise decisions, for those of you who know your Mental Capacity Act, was scene one with a woman saying, Doctor, I'd like to have an amniocentesis, please. A wise decision, Mrs. Thorne. Oh, and a home birth. Now, Susie, you obviously don't have the facts. So Polly was actually a campaigner for the Mental Capacity Act and a disability rights activist and cared passionately about the right of people to speak in terms of citizen and human rights. This wasn't about some soft therapeutic intervention. So here she is talking at a conference on service user involvement. And that slide says, citizen user involvement is about citizen voice and human rights. It was on the way back from this conference that she was in a head-on car crash just outside Brecon. And from that moment, she lost 
the ability to speak for herself. And what happened to Polly's voice then? We tried to represent what Polly would have wanted. But I don't know quite what happened, or it's a very long story. Perhaps we weren't believed, perhaps they didn't know if they could trust us as family. Perhaps her own wishes and beliefs weren't given much weight in the best interest test at that time. Certainly, some of the clinicians thought the decision belonged to them and advised us quite correctly that next of kin in England and Wales have no decision-making power to make a decision for their loved one. Clinicians also felt there were still things they could do. They still had tricks up their sleeve. There were still operations or things they could try that might slightly alter where she would land along the final diagnostic continuum. And I think what we heard earlier from Rose Taylor about organ-centered care, I think there were ways in which Polly's care was diagnostic-centered care. Let's wait and see for a year whether she remains in a permanent vegetative state or not. If she's in that category, then we'll start making best interest decisions, as if best interest decisions could be delayed until then. So life-sustaining treatment continued, in spite of our attempts to stop it. And I think that raises two questions. One is, what could the clinicians or the systems have done differently? And we put a lot of work into trying to support clinicians and address things like the law or the interpretation of the law to try and change clinical practice and systems so that there can be better best interest decision making. But it also raises the question, what could Polly have done? What could she have done? Well, she could have, for example, given me lasting power of attorney, so I had no rights as her sister to make decisions, but had I got lasting power of attorney for health and welfare, particularly if Polly had opted to tick the box, um, yes to decision making about life and death treatments, then my voice would have carried much more, roi much more weight than just a sister. The other thing she could have done would have been to write an advanced decision, the legally binding form, or an advanced statement. And that's why I'll hand over to Celia. So an advanced decision was given statutory force by the Mental Capacity Act in 2005. It's a way of recording your decision to refuse medical treatments at a future time when you can no longer make or communicate those decisions yourself. And of course, this is very useful in the context of what we've already heard is widespread over-treatment at the end of life. We were confident that Polly wouldn't have wanted life prolonging treatments. We weren't able to get withdrawal for her. Um, none of us wanted that to happen to us. And so that meant we immediately, as soon as we learned we could, put these in place. What happened to Polly is very common. It's in England and Wales. There are around 16,000 patients maintained in permanent vegetative states and around 45,000 in minimally conscious states. These states are 80% of people when asked on surveys in advance say that they wouldn't want. Best interest decisions are fairly rare for these patients, particularly in relation to clinically assisted nutrition and hydration, sometimes, which is sometimes treated as basic care rather than a medical treatment. Until recently, it was thought to be necessary to apply to the Court of Protection before withdrawing feeding tubes from these patients, um, and that also provided a structural barrier to withdrawal. That's now gone. Parallel in this, it's also very common for non-beneficial treatments to be given to older adults in the last six months of life. So this is from an international survey published in 2016, which said that that happened to around one in three patients. So 28% get CPR in the last six months, 42% are treated in ICU, 30% get dialysis, radiotherapy, transfusions. And in the last six weeks, 33% get chemotherapy. Knowing these kinds of statistics, if you've ever thought to yourself, or said to anyone, if I'm ever like that, shoot me, if I don't want to be kept alive, tethered to the machines, if I'm just a vegetable, I hate the idea of a feeding tube or a ventilator or a blood transfusion, if I have no quality of life, just let me go. Or, very commonly, people come to us because of what they saw as a protracted dying of someone in their family or friends, someone that they loved, and they said they don't want that to happen to them. Those are the kind of sentiments that bring people to advanced decisions. 
So if you have mental capacity, not everybody knows this, you are the decision maker. You have the legal right to refuse treatment for any reason or no reason at all. You can make unwise decisions, you can refuse life-prolonging treatment, and you can kind of course kill yourself. But most of us are going to lose mental capacity towards the end of our lives. There is a legal definition of mental capacity. You can lose it with progressive illnesses like dementia. You can lose it by walking out of this building right now and getting hit by a car and having a brain injury along the lines of polys. Psychological factors medically induced. Um, and out of those circumstances, it's doctors and the clinical team that will make decisions for you. And if you're happy with that, do nothing. If you want something different, then you have to do something to change it. That's just a list of the sorts of treatments that might be life prolonging, which might include your current blood pressure medication or your, you know, the stuff you're currently on, not necessarily kind of the big things. So what does an, ex an advanced decision look like? I'm going to show you three examples just to give you a sense of how simple these documents can be. So this is one that just refuses one treatment. I refuse cardiopulmonary resuscitation under all circumstances. I maintain this refusal, even if my life is shortened as a result. That's a legally binding advanced decision, as long as you've signed it and you've got a witness. Um, and, and you include what we call the magic sentence, the sentence that shows that you acknowledge that your life may be shortened as a result. It doesn't have to be exactly that wording, but it has to be something like that. So you can write an advanced decision that simple, that simply refuses one thing. You can also write a really simple advanced decision that simply refuses absolutely everything. This is a real one from um, Avril Henry, whose enthusiastic permission we have to show this. She says, I refuse all medical treatments or procedures, interventions aimed at prolonging or artificially sustaining my life. I maintain this refusal of treatment in the hope that my life will be shortened as a result. Her version of the magic sentence. More commonly, people go for something in between those two and they refuse treatments only if they're unlikely to recover what, in their view, is quality of life. Now, if you're going to say that, you have to say what you mean by quality of life because we're all different, and you have to rely on a doctor to, on the one hand, assess your prognosis, your current symptoms, your likely future, against what you describe as being quality of life for you, and make an assessment of that. So what's an advanced statement? So this is the non-legally binding part, but can be very useful, and I want to again give you three examples. So you could do anything along the range from, by quality of life, I consider worth living. I mean a return to normal, independent living. That's somebody's own definition. You can argue with it, but it's what he wanted. The other is the quality of life I would want is being able to recognise my family and friends and to take pleasure from my company. You can see those are two very different people with different approaches. So here's a statement. I don't want to be left without what I call quality of life. I can't imagine anything worse than not being able to do what I do now. I hate even being stuck indoors. I do the Stoke Roke Club, I do befriending, I see a lot of people with disabilities and can imagine living with a certain level, but if I'd also lost capacity, then I would be impaired in a way I wouldn't want. So the focus is often on the loss of mental capacity and being able to make choice. Here's another one. Independence, autonomy and competence, making my own choices are very important. I fear pain, confusion, powerlessness, more than I fear death. I do not wish those I love to become full-time carers. If I cannot meet them with emotional and mental engagement and recognition, I'd want them to go forward with their lives with joy. joy. And I feel Henry's own advanced statement, my long, happy, productive life is more than complete. Interesting in terms of Malcolm's paper. Aged 80, I now live alone in incurable, unbearable pain, which cannot be relieved by opiates, which render me dangerously dopey and incapable. So I'd now like to hand back to Celia to talk about our mother's left. So, Sheila Kitzinger, our mother, um, had in fact been helped by Polly to write what she called a living will before Polly was in the accident, but updated and revised it subsequently, and the rest of the family also made them. Our mother was a childbirth campaigner. She believed in women's rights and childbirth, and she took a very rights-based approach. Uh, to demedicalizing childbirth, to women's rights to choose in childbirth. She was keen to take childbirth out of the hospital and back into the home. Um, and she introduced birth plans into this country. So planning for death and a death at home were very much things that already mattered to her. Um, 
She, um, in her advanced decision, specifically said that she, um, when she became unable to make her own decisions, um, w did not want to be rushed into hospital, wanted to die in her own bed. And it, that was entirely consistent with everything that she'd always wanted throughout her life. And she had cancer, was dying at home, and had also appointed actually another sister, Tess, as her power of attorney for health and welfare. She had something that I took to be a stroke while I was bringing her back from the bathroom. I'm not medically qualified. It's, she was just sort of collapsed down one side as I was helping her back to bed. And um, I made her as comfortable as I could and I said, do you want me to call an ambulance? And she indicated very strongly no. And so I didn't. I phoned her GP and was subject to a bullying episode. Um, so the, I explained what had happened and the GP said, you need to call an ambulance. I said, I've asked my mother and she said, she doesn't want an ambulance. The GP, she wasn't my mother's regular GP. She was a locum, she was standing in for that. Um, the GP said, um, well, if your mother's just had a stroke, she doesn't have capacity. She doesn't know what she's saying. You must call an ambulance. That's where the advanced decision was immediately useful. So I said, well, I think she does have capacity and it's entirely consistent to say no at this point with everything she's ever done in her life. But supposing that she doesn't have capacity, I have an advanced decision in which she says she doesn't, she refuses transfer to hospital. Um, the GP shouted at me, he was actually shouting, saying, are you refusing to call an ambulance for your mother? I said, I guess I am. She said, is there anyone else in the house who will call an ambulance? I said, no, we all respect my mother's wishes. We would not do that. Um, she very reluctantly did come out some time later. The advanced decision was crucial in actually enabling that. I think she would have died in hospital had she been taken there. It felt quite a difficult thing to stand up to the GP, but the advanced decision gave me the power to do that. Had it failed, when my sister Tess came back, um, she had the power of attorney, and she would have also supported that from another position. Together, as a family, we resisted the medicalization of my mother's death. First, because I think she had capacity to say no anyway, though she wasn't in a powerful position to do it. Second, because we had the advanced decision. And third, because had it been needed, my sister Tess had power of attorney. That's how I think these things can be useful in practice. So just very briefly, of course, neither an LPA nor an advanced decision is a right tool for everybody. And of course, they're beset with problems. But certainly, I have both. I think they're better than nothing for me. But some reasons for not having an advanced decision, when well, maybe you do trust doctors to decide and feel the system is working. Maybe you're unsure what you want. Maybe you're concerned not to prejudice your future self. So some people do find themselves valuing life and circumstances that they would previously have considered intolerable. So some people in advanced decisions can actually say that, of course, or they cannot write an advanced decision. Or you may be happy for someone else to make the decisions for you that you have chosen. Some reasons for not having an LPA would be that maybe you want to retain decision-making by yourself, hence an advanced decision, or again, leave it in the hands of doctors, the default position. Or maybe you don't want to burden family or friends, or that you're worried that their own emotions will get in the way of respecting your wishes or you may simply not have anyone. So I think our concluding reflections really are that we've talked a lot so far today about some of the broad theoretical issues and cultural differences. And I hope as we think about how, what individually we can do, and I'm meaning you in the room as well, and I'd love to ask how many of you have an advanced decision? How many do you have? Yes. Two, three, four, eight. <laughs> how many of you might like an advanced decision? Uh, oh! <laughs> Oh, there's so much to be done there. One of the uh, tweets has just gone out has some information. So one of the tweets that we've done with value death hashtag will take you to a site where you can do your own. And I think I'll open for questions now. Thank you.